Mr Whitford. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. Um, what we are really discussing here is a blind Brexit, because what we have is a withdrawal agreement and six and a half pages of future deal that has now been padded out to 26. I find it strange that the economic analysis didn't include this deal. It included the checkers have your cake and eat it deal, which is not actually what we're voting on. My constituency has an airport and an aerospace campus at one end that will be hit by the loss of the single aviation market, the just-in-time supply chains, and coming out of the European Aviation Safety Agency, which allows local MRO firms to sign off planes to fly in Europe and licenses aviation engineers. At the other end, we have pharmaceuticals who are going to suffer again from losing just-in-time supply chains, but also from leaving the European Medicines Agency, the Chemicals Agency, and losing jobs that come from lot release quality control that must be carried out inside the European Union. Oh, sorry, I thought you were trying to intervene. <laughs> That's fine. You're confusing me. It's a bit late at night. <laughs> One of the other industries in my constituency is fishing, which is always held up as the great beneficiary of Brexit. But in my constituency, the catch is dominated by langoustine and lobster, 85% of which goes to the EU. And every few hours of delay decreases its value. Now, the problem for them is that actually fishermen from Northern Ireland, much as they don't want the benefit, will be able to fish in the same waters and have direct and swift access to the single market through the south of Ireland. They also will not face tariffs on processed fish, which will hit smoked salmon, not just Scotland's biggest food export, but the UK's biggest food export. And we're talking about tariffs that range from 5 to 16%. We lose our advantage over Norwegian salmon. And yet, the real problem of the fishing industry, which is that the vast majority of quota is held tightly by very few companies, will not be fixed by this. In Scotland, 80% of boats share 1% of quota. In England, 77% share 3% of quota, while a handful of firms own the majority. And an additional issue in England is that huge amounts of quota have been sold to Dutch and Spanish companies. That's not Europe doing that. That's not the common fisheries policy. It's because this place has never cared about fishing. Yeah. Up until now, yeah. it was always expendable. But, oh, it's been a very useful ploy around Brexit. One of the other things that's been missing for us coming up to making this decision is that the government in their analysis claim that actually the economic impact will be minimal if there is no change to immigration. Well, that's funny. The Prime Minister has put all her effort into creating a hostile environment just to drive European immigration down. Their own economic assessment shows that European immigration contributes at least 2% to GDP, and the migration report showed that they contribute over £2,300 a head more to public finances. These people help our economy as well as our public services, as well as our communities. And in Scotland, we need people for our demographics and our economic growth. And we welcome them. And that's why we need control of immigration. Because if the government's plans to set a threshold of £30,000 go ahead, Three quarters of the European citizens here now wouldn't qualify. And the impact of that across public services would be immense. The failure in 2016 was to fail to talk about the benefits of Europe, what they contribute to our workforce in public services, particularly health. Health isn't delivered by machines and hospitals, it's delivered by people. Health care workers, social care workers, they don't earn over 30,000. Junior nurses, care workers, junior doctors even, don't earn over 30,000. And 150,000 of them look after us when we're sick. We've also had the opportunity to carry a European health insurance card that has allowed even people on dialysis to travel to Europe. 
You tell me what is the price of health insurance that will cover that. It has allowed our pensioners to retire to the sun, where they paid no tax, but they have been able to transfer their rights. The European Medicines Agency has not increased bureaucracy. It decreased it by creating a single licensing system. And while the government talks about replacing research money, research isn't just about funding, it's about collaboration. And you can't sit in a muddy field on your own and call it collaboration. We are only going to lose. We lose the public health drive and pressure that we've had from Europe. We lose that collaboration and we lose both the academic and medical research. Earlier, one of the MPs, maybe the member for Uxbridge, was dismissing concerns about radioisotopes. Yeah. It's funny, the president of the Royal College of Radiologists is concerned about access to radioisotopes. UK doesn't manufacture them. Molybdenum has a half-life of 66 hours, and we have to import it from elsewhere. And up until now, since the loss and crisis in 2009, the Euratom Supply Agency has managed that supply. It will be diminishing as these old reactors go offline. And we'll be outside begging to have the chance, can we please have enough technetium for our patients? These are the things that we are going to lose. And I can tell you, I voted... Yeah, I will. Thank you, friend, for giving way. Of course, um, we're already starting to lose these things. Is it not the case that the academic institutions she talks about, the health institutions that she talks about, are already having to make plans? People are not coming to this country. Goods are not coming to this country. Academic research is not coming to this country. And that's before Brexit even actually hits. Well, we already know that there's been a 90% drop in European nurses coming here and a 14% of European doctors in Scotland and 19% in England are already in the process of leaving, with many more considering it. So there's people right across the spectrum that are already considering or already leaving. And the problem is we are the losers for what they have contributed. I and my constituents voted clearly to remain, as did voters across Scotland. And we still wish to remain, and we will still fight to remain. The Prime Minister kept saying, it's my deal or no deal. But now she's changed her tune. She says, it's my deal, no deal, or no Brexit. Well, we'll take no Brexit, thank you very much. But as my colleague from Edinburgh East pointed out, what we have seen in the last two and a half years, where the Prime Minister refers to the precious union, is actually the utter contempt she holds for Scotland. And I can tell you that has been seen from Scotland. What has been shown is the democratic deficit and the fact the only way to control your own future is to be in control of your own future. And Scotland will be making that decision as well as supporting staying in the EU. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah.